Good morning, and welcome to this service of worship. I am Reverend Bill Ingraham. Hold on a moment. Ha, ah, autumn must be approaching quickly. <laughs> um, I am Bill Ingraham, and it is my honor and joy to serve this church, First Church Congregational in Methuen, Massachusetts, United Church of Christ, as senior pastor. Welcome to the service. Whether you're here in person or watching online, it is a blessing to be together today. I have a few announcements before we start our service today. The first one is just to folks on Facebook to remind you to hit the like or the heart button when that feels appropriate. And also if you post a note to say hello, you can greet one another, which is part of the way we keep fellowship even when we're not together and in person. Um, I also wanna just a reminder for everybody who's in the room, uh, and also folks who are watching too, that the church board is monitoring the COVID-19 transmission rates and hospitalizations and infection rates, all those things. Every single week, that's a policy they passed this month, was that they're going to monitor closely every single week um, what's happening with the pandemic in our area. And so this last week, the transmission rate leapt up a little bit. We're still below the CDC recommendation of mandatory masking inside, um, but I am convinced, I cannot speak for the board until the vo board actually votes, but I am convinced when we hit that number that we're gonna be putting our masks back on inside. Um, but we'll, we'll see, just know that there will be an announcement if that's what we're doing. Um, so just so you know, we're, we're gonna follow the guidance of the CDC, um, but also um, do everything we can to make people feel comfortable and welcome and safe. So the other announcement in the bulletin, in the call to worship, the fourth line, so it's the second time you speak, there is a word missing that's rather obvious, and it would, it would dawn on every single person while we were doing the call to worship. Um, let us hearts and voices, it should be let us lift hearts and voices. So now you've been asked to insert that, remember it in your brain, I'm sure you will. If not, it'll be fine. But that was an error in the bulletin and that is totally my fault. Um, I had a Wednesday that was back-to-back -back things from very early until very late. And so I got Roberta the call to worship the next day and I didn't catch it in the edit and neither did she. Um, she was in the first week of chapel school so I'm gonna take all the credit for that mistake. Um, and so thank you for your patience. This week we do, oh, let's, then let's talk about chapel for a moment. They had a great first week of school. They have 66 children um, registered. They have the largest number of early drop-off, late pickup, and lunch bunch, which are add-ons to our program, that they've ever had at the start of a school year. And all the teachers were very excited this week. The kids had a great week. I can't tell you how wonderful it is um, living in the parsonage next door to the playground to hear children out on the playground laughing and yelling and teachers talking and seeing them playing. Um, know that if you come to the church during the week, we are following strict guidelines on that. So if you come into the building, you will have to wear a mask and check in at the office when the preschool's in session. Outreach meeting is Monday night, 6.30 p.m. by Zoom. Anyone is welcome to join that group. And so just let me know and I will make sure you have the Zoom link for that meeting. Monday night, 6.30 p.m. outreach committee. And those are the announcements I have. So joys and concerns, you have all been praying for Benji Johnson, my um, dear, I call her my Filipino sister. I should say Filipina, actually, to be proper. Um, she had had a bilateral mastectomy for breast cancer. This week, she got back all the pathology reports. She's great. She does not need chemo. She does not need radiation. Only hormone therapy for probably five years. We are thrilled. So I wanna thank you for all of your prayers and say I will welcome your prayers still. And that brings to mind, of course, everyone else who in any way is living with cancer. And so we hold in our hearts and in our prayers um, everyone uh, who's living with cancer. We do have someone in the church who's having a, a outpatient surgical procedure this morning, but I don't have permission to say a name. So just in your hearts and prayers, um, add in, and some of you may know who it is. If you're on the weekly um, chats, you might have seen her on video chats. Um, 
just know to keep somebody in your prayers. It, it's something that's good to get it done. Is everything's going to be fine, but we want to hold that person in our prayers. And then the last thing, yesterday was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And I was asked by the mayor of Methuen, Neil Perry, to participate in the city's um, service of remembrance. It was on what's called Patriot's Bridge, the bridge on Lowell Street where you cross the mill pond um, between the fire station and downtown. And um, it was just a moving service. But the main thing it has done for me, so I've not been a big uh, person on observing 9-11 every year. I mean, I always think about it, and it's often in my heart and in, in my heart and in my awareness. Um, but for somehow this, reason, this year was really big, and maybe it was for you too, recognizing what a significant anniversary it was, especially those of us who remember that day. I was in Portland, Maine on 9-11 um, with my friend Eric C. Smith, and we watched on television um, the towers collapsing. So, um, that said, we pray for peace. We pray for um, a remembrance that drives us to build a society that is both equal and um, empowering and also safe. And um, we hold in tenderness those of us who for any reason at whatever point are grieving a loss that feels significant. Wow, I hadn't known I was going to say all that, so that you don't have to pay any extra. That was free. Um, those are the other joys and concerns I have today. It is a joy to be together in worship. And so now I'm going to invite our liturgist for today to lead us in the call to worship. Remember the word lift on your second time. Good morning. My my name is Anne Benedicts, and it is my honor and privilege to assist in worship this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the time for worship and for praise. Let us lift hearts and voices to the God of heaven and earth. This is the moment to be open to the Spirit's stirrings.
Please join me in the morning prayer. We give you thanks, most gracious and loving God, for the blessing of your presence among us. You love each of us and everyone everywhere with a love that will never let us go. Through prophets, teachers, preachers, and other faithful servants, you have shared your word with us generation after generation. And in Jesus the Christ, your Son, our Savior, you have shown us the way. Help us to live our lives after Christ's example, staying true to your ways of love and compassion, whatever may come our way. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. So I'm excited. Last week we had two children here who could come forward for children's time. I don't know if they'll do it, but this week we have four. So I invite children, if they're willing, to come forward. And at home, any children or youth who are watching, um, to imagine yourself here on the, on the floor or the steps with us. And we'll have our children's time. So good to see you. I'm so excited. Welcome back. I've seen all of you off and on through the pandemic, but it's so nice to see you in church. I'm so excited. So um, have you ever played Follow the Leader? Okay. Have you ever played? So the way Follow the Leader goes is um, usually it's like in a line and some person goes and everybody follows where they go. And so it might be that they go up and over steps and around this way, up and around a tree and hang on a branch and move... So that's one way to play follow the leader. There's also follow the leader we used to play, which is kind of like Simon Says. So you know what Simon Says is? Okay, so Simon Says, raise your right hand, put it down. Ah! So there you go. So um, there's a way to do follow the leader where you um, follow the leader, but also do what the leader does. And so you just have to kind of watch and pay attention. So sometimes you'll be walking along and somebody will raise their right hand. So I'll let you do this. Raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. We're not going anywhere, but we'll sit here and do follow the leader. And then um, maybe they put up their other hand. Maybe they start doing this. And they start doing this. And they do this. And they do this. And they do this. And so as you're walking along, you're doing all these silly things that the leader is doing. And so that can be really fun. And you can tell I haven't had anybody to play follow the leader with in a long time. So I'm having a good time, even though, oh, thank you, Haley. Oh, there you go. Now I'm getting some people. Okay, good, because follow the leader alone is really exhausting. But it still can be fun. So I did all that so that when I do things as leader, you got to follow me. And that was fun. I'll admit, it's also fun for the leader, but I like playing that kind of follow the leader with somebody else too. I don't have to be the leader to have fun, especially if they're silly, because I like being silly, which you may have figured out in the time, Haley's going, oh yeah, I figured that out. In the time that you've known me, you might have figured that out. So, so as a church, as a congregation, as a community of faith, both the people here and the people watching um, at home, online, who do we follow? You had your hand up first. Our sister or our brother. Okay, so you follow your sisters or your brothers. That's really good. That's right. And there's lots of right, there's lots of right answers for this one. Haley, who do you think? Your role model. Your role model. Okay, and in our church, do you, are there some people you could name as role models? You. Well, me, thank you. I hope I'm a role model. I try to be. Um, yeah, I won't say who it is, but somebody said, nope. Um, and then that's somebody's father, I won't say who it is, went, oh. Anyway, um, so, so hopefully the pastor, right? Um, but there are other people that we think are role models too. In fact, if I were to start naming people, I would name every single person in this room who in some ways is a role model for us in the church as they try to be faithful. It might be really different from one person to the next. So like um, from your mom to your dad, it might be a very different kind of leading, but each of them have ways that they lead us in the church and are helpful. So it's really true. And so one of the other people that we follow 
the, probably the primary one, the most important one, do you know who that is? I'll give you a hint, he's up there going, what up? up here in the window. Who's that? Jesus, very good. Um, and so the one that we really try to follow is Jesus because he came and lived on earth um, and he told people about God's love but he also showed people about God's love and he cared so much that people that had been really rejected or really sick or really um, troubled he helped them find healing from all of that and feel healthy and whole and full and even people who were mean he was able to teach them if they would listen and care he could teach them to be compassionate and caring so one of the things we try to do as a church is we try to follow Jesus and do the things that he did so that's one of the reasons we listen to the scripture that gets read which will be get read get read in a little bit in worship and the hymns that we sing that have words about Jesus and this children's time and my sermon and when we have it and we will have it again it's just going to be a while Sunday school we learn about faith and following Jesus there and every leader in this room um, has understandings and so they might tell us in actual words or they might tell us in what they do or even Tell us about following Jesus and how they treat us so that we can learn to follow Jesus and what we do. One of our biggest goals as a church, besides knowing that God loves us, is to learn how to live after Jesus' example so that we can let the world know God loves them too. Thank you so much. We're going to say a prayer and a repeat after me prayer, okay? Let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for Jesus. Help us to follow him. Amen. I'm so glad you were here today. Thank you.
Thank you, Carol and Joe and Kathy. So we come now to our time for prayer together. I invite you to join me as we lift our hearts to God. Let us pray. We thank you, loving God, for a love that never lets us go. We thank you, compassionate God, for grace and mercy that looks beyond our faults and even loves us through our faults and offers us hope and help and strength in the midst of our frailty. We pray to you, God, lifting up the whole of our lives and all of our concerns and our joys together, trusting you to hold these things in your hands, even as you hold us in your hands and all our loved ones in your hands, both this day and for all eternity. We gather before you now and we offer our prayers, aware that our lives are very much an accumulation of our experiences, an accumulation of joys and an accumulation of sorrows, a gathering up and collecting over time of disappointments and a gathering up and collecting through the years and even the decades of blessings for which we are grateful. And so as we come before you in prayer, we bring the whole of our lives and we offer you our praise. We trust you to know our concerns, both those we have been praying to you earnestly, whether together in this room or individually in our lives, wherever we might offer you our prayers. We trust those prayers to you, prayers for people who are sick, prayers for people who are troubled, prayers for those of us in our moments of grief and our facing of um, addictions and other substance use disorders and our struggle um, with emotional health all these things that touch us from time to time, some of us more deeply, some of us more profoundly, yet each of us touched by all these concerns. We lift those up to you. And we trust that as these concerns can become heavy over time, accumulated as they are, that your love and your compassion can set us free. And your power made known to us through the Holy Spirit can in fact bring us healing of body, mind, and spirit. Whether it's healing wrought by physicians or nurses or physician's assistants or other healthcare professionals, therapists, counselors, 12-step programs, whatever the form of help may be as it comes to us. We are grateful for the working of healing in those ways. Also the healing that comes to us from love and friendship, from a person reaching out in our time of need and letting us know we are loved and thought about and cared for. We are so grateful. And the ways your spirit works healing through us when we recognize our capacity to reach out and touch another and offer love and offer care. Help us, gracious God, not only to be recipients of your healing power, but also to be people who share it as well as we seek to be loving caring people who live after Christ's example. We pray for this church, grateful for its ministry in this place for centuries now and for the ministry it has even now, day by day. Grateful for everyone in this room or who has been in this room, both in this still pandemic time or over the ages past. Everyone who is with us now online, everyone who is with us in any way, we are grateful to be a community together, to learn and live and love together and to offer you our praise together and to work to make a difference in the community around us, quite actually to make it a better place because your love has healed and inspired us and empowered us to serve and be generous in the world around us. 
Now for the rest of this time of worship, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds. Fill us with a sense of your Spirit's calling and your gospel's blessing that we can find ways to be more and more faithful day by day. All these things we pray in Christ's name as we offer now silent prayers in the name of Jesus. Hear now our prayers. These prayers we offer in the name of Jesus as we say together the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we come now for the time of offering, even though we don't um, have ushers walking up and down the aisles now. I wanted to share with you a story that happened this last week. The stewardship committee met on Thursday night. That's the group of people in the church that's charged with helping us be faithful stewards as a congregation. So it means both using our time and talent, our gifts, our um, energies, our passions in ways that serve God in this church and in the world around us. And also they're charged with helping raise the money that supports the ministry of this church and create opportunities for people to give to things that matter in our community. So they met last week, some of the members of that committee or ministry team here in the room now. And I will admit, each year before stewardship meets, I realize, oh, it's stewardship campaign time. Uh, uh. You can see me like scuffing my foot on the ground because we're about to have to meet and do that. And it can be such hard work. Oh, okay. And then I meet with the stewardship committee of this church and they just start talking and they start dreaming and they start thinking about the life of this church and what we're doing and what's happening and how God has blessed us. And then they start thinking about how we can help people to appreciate just how much God has blessed us. And by the end of that meeting, every time, I am enthusiastic about our upcoming stewardship program, enthusiastic about the people in this church who are so generous and faithful, enthusiastic about the ways this congregation continues to serve God in new ways, no matter what the day is or no matter what the times bring. This church is a place of faithfulness and of generosity and of service. So I'm not going to give away anything from what their plans are for this year. You'll get to hear all those things when we get to November. But I just want to say, this is a pretty remarkable place. And there's a lot of faithful people offering the best they can. And because of that, we're able to serve God in countless ways, many of which we'll never even be able to speak, but that are touching lives and making a difference. So with that said... I invite you to consider your gift, whether it's already been given through an e-gift or whether it's something you're going to drop in the offering plate on the way out today or a check you're at home writing right now and putting it in an envelope. I want you to think about giving that gift with gratitude for all God has done for us. Let us receive our morning offering.
The scripture this morning, the scripture reading this morning, comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said, this, he said this all quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May the living word of God speak to us through these ancient words of scripture. I love that in our tradition, meaning First Church Congregational, um, members of the church read the scripture every week. It's not that I can't read the scripture, I can. Um, and I've served churches where the pastor was um, required to be the one who read scripture and worship. Um, it has always been my preference for lay people to read it, not only because I want there to be different voices than mine that are spoken, but also each one of you brings to the task of worship. And worship is a task. It's one of the jobs we have. It's not just my job. I get, I get paid to be here. Um, but it, it's all of our job, and we bring to the task of worship our whole life, our faith, our aspirations. And as Anne read today, I'm sorry, Anne, I'm, I'm picking you out in front of the whole congregation. I can imagine this little girl that went to the German Presbyterian Church and was taught the Bible by faithful Sunday school teachers and listened sitting by her parents in the sanctuary as the scriptures were read and has read scriptures with her husband and with her daughter and her whole life long and then today stood up and read a passage in worship. Um, I, anyway, that's a gift. I just, I just wanted to point out some remarkable things happen in worship we don't even think about um, and it's a way this church is a special place and I am so grateful to be here. So my sermon title is Denial, Identity, and Crosses. I got to admit, that was what I put on in um, August when I was making plans for uh, this month. It, it didn't occur to me that by the time I got to today, I would want to call the sermon Scandal. Um, not, not so much because I'm in a scandalous mood, although what would that be for a pastor to be in a scandalous mood? I'm not sure I want to know. I, I, and if, it, if there is a pastor in a scandalous mood, I hope it's not me. <laughs> uh, but this passage is one about which it has been said, um, this is the scandal of the gospel. Paul, the Apostle Paul is the first one in um, one of his letters to the church in Corinth who wrote about the scandal of the gospel. And that scandal being that Jesus is not the kind of Messiah we expected him to be. We, you and I, well, our whole lives we've understood, our whole faith lives we've understood um, Jesus in the light of the gospel. But in uh, the time of Jesus, um, his contemporaries and even 
Um, some folks, um, well, afterwards, are Jewish brothers and sisters still waiting for the Messiah to come? There was an understanding of the Messiah being one who would come like a mighty king, a mighty military leader, and conquer all evil and bring it to an end once and for all. There are no especially in the time of Jesus, when they were living in a nation um, overrun by a foreign occupying government, the Romans, um, who had set up their own um, governor in the state who had a strong military presence, who were taxing the people um, well beyond their means to support that military and that governor, uh, who had imposed on them religiously to have a different high priest in the temple, one that would um, adhere to what Rome wanted him to do. It, it was a harsh and terrible time. And so in the time of Jesus especially, and when this gospel was written, which we think it was written probably around the time of the destruction of the temple, maybe leading right up to it, which would have been in 60, the year 60, um, 60 AD, or um, CE, common era, as we now tend to say. They were looking for a Messiah who would come and conquer the Romans once and for all kick out the occupying army, get rid of this oppression of common people and free them all to, to know God's blessing and to live, it, live accordingly, to heal their wounds, to lift up their nation and make it greatest among all nations on earth. <laughs> Yesterday in the 9-11 observation um, over on Patriot's Bridge, the mayor threw off that line that you often hear an American politician say, you know, we're a part of the greatest nation on earth. I was standing by the imam of the mosque here in Methuen, who is Turkish, and when the program was over, I turned to him and said, you know, there are other countries that think they're pretty good too. <laughs> and he laughed. He said, yeah. <laughs> um, but they really did have an understanding in ancient Israel that when the Messiah came all of the oppressive other governments who had come and ruled over them at different times in their history and done them great harm, all of that would come to an end and they would be liberated and God's very heaven would be established on earth. And so it is a scandal. It is a scandal, what, what scholars often call the scandal of particularity. And that, that would have been a good title for a sermon, wouldn't it? The scandal of particularity. This notion that Jesus, Jesus was God incarnate, that God chose to dwell among us as a human, a real honest to goodness, I guess I could say honest to God, honest to goodness human, real, full, holy human. Um, if, if, if he cut himself on a branch as a kid, he bled. I, just like you and me, hungry in the morning. I won't name any more of the stuff that we have to do in the morning. Just imagine Jesus, fully human. The scandal of God coming and being a human. That was, that was scandal enough. But God's so one with us as it says in the Gospel of John, I've quoted this lately, but I love it. The word came and dwelt among us for a while. In the Greek, that's pitched tent. Came and live as our next door neighbor, like you and me, fully human. One of the things the pandemic has done for us that maybe someday will be a blessing is to help us recognize how very frail life is and how we really are in the end. While we might imagine otherwise, we really are frail humans with a finite time and we don't know how many days are numbered for us. Anyway, God became human in Jesus the Christ and Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. And so, as they're walking along, and Jesus says to his disciples, who do the people say that I am? Uh, different ones speak up, and they name some of the prophets. They say John the Baptist, which is remarkable. John was a, a contemporary of Jesus's. He was his cousin. 
Um, remember the story of when Mary came into Elizabeth's presence, the baby in Mary's womb, that was John, leapt um, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus and Elizabeth was pregnant with John. Um, little baby John inside leapt when Jesus came near. They were cousins. They were contemporaries. It's really peculiar for the a disciple for the disciples to have observed that people think somehow Jesus was John reincarnated. They were almost the same age. Um, not just that, Elijah, other prophets, the people were seeing Jesus in holy terms and were recognizing, though they didn't quite understand, that he was somehow about God's salvation of the people. And then Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, bless his heart, Peter. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus, much perhaps to their surprise, says, tell no one of this. And then he starts explaining what's going to happen. That the Son of Man will undergo great suffering. I'm reading the scripture here. Be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. So he said that quite openly. But Peter pulled Jesus off to the side and started to rebuke him, saying, Oh, don't, don't say these things, Jesus. But Jesus turned for the others to hear and then rebuked Peter in front of everybody else, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind on human things, not divine things. <laughs> the tough part for Peter is he actually got it right, at least partially right. He understood that Jesus was the Messiah, that somehow he was about God's act of salvation of the world and of the people, that somehow he was about this transformation of society, somehow he was about lifting oppression, bringing healing, bringing liberation, hope, life. But he didn't quite understand what it meant. And so when, when Jesus explained what it means for him to be the Messiah... That he's not coming in on a mighty horse to conquer the Romans and chase them out of town. But instead, going to stay true to God's word. And if that, not if, when that brings his arrest and his persecution and his death, he's going to go through with it. But three days later, he'll rise again. I wonder if Peter even heard the three days later part, he'll rise again. Uh, Peter did hear the, uh, the statement about Jesus having to suffer and to die. Um, was it because he didn't want Jesus to suffer and die that he rebuked Jesus and asked him to be quiet and stop talking about these things? What was it because he wanted Jesus to be the Messiah that would conquer the Romans that he told Jesus to be quiet? And not to talk about these things. Did Peter, did, bless his heart, Peter, I don't know why I'm calling him that. Did, did, did bless his heart, Peter, want Jesus to be something that he wanted rather than something Jesus needed to be? Did Peter even want himself and his life to be what he wanted not what Jesus needed him to be Peter got his comeuppance you could say um, Jesus said get behind me Satan in this term I just think tempter um, I imagine that what Peter was saying I can imagine Jesus, if he really was, and I think he was, fully human, not really wanting to suffer and die and be killed. If Jesus was really human, which I absolutely believe he was, having that sense of frailty, looking at his own death and saying, okay, I think there's resurrection on the other side, I think. But on this side of resurrection, it's always a, a thought, an assertion of faith, an assertion of hope. Jesus told Peter to be quiet. 
And then he said to his disciples, if any of you, if any of you want to be great, if you want to be my followers, then you need to take up your cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Peter found out, his disciples found out, that Jesus as the Messiah was coming in willing to sacrifice even his own life to accomplish God's good intentions for all the world. And Peter and his disciples found out that part of the calling of being a follower of Jesus is being willing, like Jesus, to set our own lives on the line for the gospel's sake and for the sake of faith. I can't begin to say what that will mean for you, for me. I sure don't believe in uh, foolheartedly running out and jumping in front of trains or buses or cars or whatever. Um, I think the impulse we have to be safe and to care for ourselves is really important. The ones we teach our children to be safe and care for themselves is so essential. You have to recognize our lives and faith free us to know God's love so that we can live after Jesus' example and like him be willing to give our whole selves so that love will be known. <laughs> I gotta say, I do think that's a little bit scandalous. Please pray with me. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for your countless blessings and for the chance we have to know your love made known to us in Jesus the Christ. Help us, God, to follow him. And while we do not seek, nor do we long for suffering or struggle, Help us to be willing so to be dedicated to your love and your ways of heaven that we will follow you above all else in our lives. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. seated. Uh, by jumping to the last verse, I didn't give Anne time to get the candles. Um, so while she's catching up, um, I'll say again what a blessing it is to be together and to follow a Savior who teaches us, convicts us of God's love for us to our deepest, most core self, and then calls us to be willing to share that in the world in ways that make a difference. Hear now the benediction. Go in peace to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. 
trusting God to hold you in love now and for all eternity, whatever might come your way. Amen.